All right, so my name is Jason Carter. Today I'm going to be talking about powerlifting and how it can affect you in the gym. So before we get started, my, uh, my credentials in powerlifting, why I feel I am qualified to tell you about the basics of powerlifting. I myself am a powerlifter. I compete in the World United Amateur Powerlifting Federation. It is an international federation that's been around for 27 years now. So it's as far as powerlifting federations go, that one's actually pretty old. Uh, I, I compete nationally. I don't, I don't compete in the international meets because I'm not nearly good enough for that. <laughs> um, and I have an above average total. And what that means is uh, powerlifters are judged by their total in a competition, which is essentially you have three max effort attempts on the squat, three on the bench, three on the deadlift. You add your uh, best of each of those together, and that is your total. And that's how you rank. I am I mean, just barely above average. So I feel that's good enough to let me speak about the basics. So. <laughs> So, right off the bat, benefits of powerlifting. Uh, as you can see by Mr. Dan Green here, muscle mass is definitely a big appeal for men, especially. Um, nothing's going to put muscle on you like powerlifting, honestly. You're lifting heavy quite often. You're lifting high volume, high intensity. You're going to get bigger and stronger. That's a big plus for men. Most men really enjoy that. A lot of women kind of shy away from that. But it's important to remember, as Jerry mentioned, lifting is very unlikely, almost impossible to make a woman overly bulky without help from steroids. Once those steroids in the mix, that completely changes everything. But for a what's called a natural competitor, so no steroids, not going to happen. And you're also going to lose a lot of fat. As again, you can tell from the picture, Dan Green does not carry much fat on him. That is because uh, muscle does burn fat very efficiently, and the actual process of building muscle is going to burn a lot of fat. Again, you're lifting heavy, you're lifting often. That's going to burn a lot of calories for you. And personally, my uh, favorite benefit of power routine is concrete goals. If you ask most people who are just starting working out for the first time, what are your goals? Uh, you might be able to agree with this. 90% of the time, they're going to say, I just want to get in shape, or I want to be in better shape. That's very typical, and it's also very vague. That's hard to really, as a personal trainer, sit down and quantify better shape. That's, that's kind of difficult to work with. But with powerlifting, since you're being judged off of the numbers you put up in the weight room, that is uh, something very easy to set a goal on. You know, if you're squatting 225 and you want to squat 315, you know, it's right there. You, you know what you're pushing for every day. And the same thing can be done with your circumference measurements, BMI, whatever you want to look at. With powerlifting, there's always a quantifiable number you can use to judge your progress. So, how does one train in powerlifting? Uh, for the most part, the most common split is the West Side Method, developed by West Side Barbell in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, West Side Barbell was created by two men, um, Louis Simmons and Chuck Vogelpo from Russia. They came up with the West Side System, or they, they uh, refined the West Side System from old Russian techniques. Uh, and we're going to get into that here on the next slide. We're also going to talk about raw versus gear. Shortly though, raw is what you see Probably every single person you've ever seen in the weight room lifts raw, just shirts, t-shirt, nothing special, maybe a belt, maybe knee sleeves even. Whereas gear is kind of its own special animal that we'll talk about. Uh, before we get into that, we'll talk about the two most common types of training systems in powerlifting. So we have the West Side method, which I personally follow, and we have the Strong Lifts method, which my fiance recently started following. Uh, we'll start with the West Side method. As you can see on Monday, we'll go over the abbreviations real quick, SQ, squat, uh, BP, bench press, and DL, I think it's, yeah, DL, deadlift. Uh, those are the three lifts that are being trained, three compound movements. So on Monday, I would train squat with the max effort. So very heavy for low reps. Uh, for me, heavy, West Side calls heavy about 93% of your max. So it's heavy. You're not going to be able to do more than two or three reps. Uh, and then we have DE, which is the uh, dynamic effort, which is the complete opposite of max effort, essentially. We're working with 45 to 55% of your max, so really not a whole lot of weight uh, relative to what you could do, but you're doing it as fast as you physically can. I mean, you're putting that 100% effort for max effort into half the weight. So you're trying to move that weight as quickly as you can, and that develops uh, power, which is a combination of speed and strength. And that's where powerlifting comes from. Powerlifting is really more about speed than it is strength, which kind of seems weird. You would think it'd be almost entirely strength, but when you've got a, you know, the, the 
the most you can squat sitting across your back, you don't want to be holding it very long. So you're, you're wanting to move pretty quick. Uh, and then I have ACC, that's accessories. Accessory movements are anything that builds your compound movement. So it might be something like a, uh, a glute ham raise on squat day. You really want to keep you targeting the hamstrings there. Uh, that's just a little extra work, get some more volume in, keep yourself safe, injury proof. And then after accessory, you go into supplemental work, which is any movement that helps your accessory movements. So these are typically uh, more isolate, uh, isolation based movements, and they're usually pretty easy. Uh, an example, if you do a glute ham raise for your accessory, a supplemental might be um, just banded leg curls for like one set of 100, even. just something really light, keep the blood flow going, again, that's going to help prevent injury. Uh, that's the, the West Side Method clearly has a lot of volume. We're looking at four days a week with a lot of different movements going on. Whereas Strong Lift takes a different approach to it. As you can see, almost everything on there is uh, five sets of five reps. And again, it's squat, deadlift, bench press. And the difference here is you're getting a greater volume uh, per workout rather than per week. So, for instance, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'll start off with five by five on squat. A lot of squatting. Uh, that's really the point of strong lifts is that you're getting a lot of volume in on the squat. And then, as opposed to having accessories and supplemental movements, you're doing squat, bench press, and barbell row all in one day. So it's all big compound movements where you really get a lot of bang for your buck there instead of kind of splitting it up more. So that's a very easy program for beginners to follow, which is why my fiance does it. It's, uh, it's, it's an easy way to ease yourself into the idea of power. So, Raw versus gear that I mentioned. <laughs> the big difference is here, uh, obviously we're both squatting here. The raw competitor here, uh, that's Dan Green again from an earlier slide. I mean, he's wearing shorts, t-shirt, he's got a belt around him, which is you know, pretty typical stuff. You can probably go downstairs right now and see that exact thing. Then we look over at the, the big guy there wearing his squat gear. I don't know if you can tell in that picture or not, but his, he's wearing a it looks like a singlet, but it's a big rubber suit, essentially. And what that does is it builds a lot of tension up at the bottom of the movement and acts as a spring to come back up. Uh, it, this type of geared lifting was originally created as injury prevention, but once people saw, you know, yeah, it prevents injury, but I also am squatting 80 pounds heavier, it grew and grew and grew, and now it's at the point where, um, I mean, the world record for raw squat is 928, I believe. Gear is like 1300, so it adds a lot of weight. Uh, same thing with bench press. There's bench press shirts, raw record 722, uh, equip record, I believe it is 1058 right now. Higher than the squat. I mean, it, it adds a lot of weight. And the way the bench suit works is, the <clears throat> if you picture a regular shirt, the sleeves on the shirt are like right here, and it's again made out of a rubber material. They even use denim occasionally. So when you finally get squeezed in there and you bring the bar down, there's a huge stretch being placed in the middle of the shirt and that, I mean, it's like a giant rubber band pulling that way back up. So that's, uh, that's the two different forms of powerlifting. Uh, gear used to be the only form up until late 80s, I would say. They almost, ex it was exclusively geared lifting. Uh, nowadays, raw is becoming more and more popular because uh, as some of you might be thinking now, that gear kind of seems like cheating. I mean, the suit's doing a lot of work for you. Uh, that's kind of how I feel too. I compete raw. Uh, I just don't see the point in artificially raising your numbers, in my opinion. Uh, not taking anything away from those guys. I mean, you take that suit off, I mean, it's still significantly stronger than everyone, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless. So, some misconceptions about powerlifting. As you can see by this gentleman in the picture, uh, he is not as lean as the other guy we were looking at. He's uh, probably pushing about 400 pounds and does not look very healthy. That's what people often picture when they hear powerlifting. They see these huge, I mean, job of the hut looking guys who just don't look athletic at all. And that does exist. I mean, the, the biggest weight class in powerlifting is for anyone over 300 pounds. So, I mean, that, that does exist. But where the misconception comes in is that all powerlifters look like that, or that's what everyone's goal is. Uh, some people certainly say, hey, I'm just going to get as big as I can and lift heavy weights. That's great. More power to them. But it's not uh, prerequisite by any means. Um, I'm thinking off the top of my head, 
the summer, <coughs> the paddle team coming up this summer, national championship, there's 40 guys in the 220 weight class, and there's like three in the 308 plus. It's just not popular. It happens, but that, that's not what powerlifting is about. Uh, second link, steroids. Uh, steroids are incredibly popular in powerlifting. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There's a lot of guys on steroids, but, and women as well. But you absolutely don't have to be. And I would, I would say the majority of competitors are not on steroids, uh, especially at the smaller meets. It's, I mean, it, it's a sport based around, it's event based around lifting as much weight as possible. Keeping steroids out of that is going to be really hard. There are federations that drug test really well and keep steroid users out, and that's great. And they, they've got a lot of popularity. The uh, U.S. Powerlifting Federation is the biggest one. Uh, but then there's a lot of federations that are steroid free, but literally never drug test. It's just kind of on the honor system. And what that creates is, is kind of an interesting atmosphere in powerlifting where um, there's federations where everyone's kind of in agreement, hey, this is where you lift if you're on steroids, and if you're not, you lift in the USAPL, where there's drug testing. And it, it really creates a cool kind of system because uh, it, it really separates the two groups. You know, with most pro sports, you see a record and you say, oh, you know, cool, 73 home runs, but was he on steroids? That doesn't really happen in powerlifting because it's, everyone does a good job of staying on their own side. Which is really unique to powerlifting, I believe. You don't really see that in any other sport. And part of that stems from the amount of federations there are. Uh, then our last misconception here is uh, the exclusiveness of powerlifting. I think a lot of people, when you mention powerlifting, just think of competitions and meets. And while a lot of powerlifters do a lot of competitions and meets, that's really the, the goal. Um, it's certainly not necessary. I mean, there's a lot of people that train powerlifting systems that don't compete. Uh, and that's that's perfectly fine, and that's that's great because you're really competing with yourself at those meets. You know, there's world records, state records, all that. But at the end of the day, you're trying to beat your own record. That, that's what you're out there to do. Uh, if you break a state record, you're awesome. But it, it's really about self-competition and bettering yourself. That's why I really like about powerlifting is the uh, just the environment of it's great. There's it, it's really a great place to be. So, are there any questions? Yeah. So when you talk about raw and gear, do those people compete like in the same events? Because when they have an advantage? Good question, yes, they absolutely do. Uh, every, most federations have a <coughs> gear division and a raw division. So they'll be at the same meets, squat right next to each other, but they aren't uh, judged the same. Okay. So, yeah, good question. For the raw, what, what can you wear? Uh, in every single federation, you're allowed a belt uh, for raw. That's, that's always allowed. And then after that, it gets a little foggy. Some federations allow knee sleeves as raw. Some allow knee wraps, which are a three meter long, um, really stretchy, uh, I can't think of the name of the material, but just a band that you, you wrap really tightly around your leg. I mean, to the point where you can't bend your knee. And then once you've got the weight on your back, that helps drive you down. Some call that raw, some don't. Uh, really just depends on the federation. And then, that, that's it for raw. Anything past that, you're, you're in here. Yes? I have a question. How did your, is your fiance doing it because you are, or is she passionate about it as well? Or? Uh, we don't know yet. Oh. She, <laughs> she started, she, she said, you know, hey, Jason, I want to get physically active. She used to run cross country and liked that, but her knees are a little beat up from all the impact. So uh, she wants to start lifting. So, you know, I, I know a fair amount about lifting, so I, I uh, point her in the direction of that program. She really likes it so far. We're only about two months in, so we'll see if it, it sticks or not. We're kind of at the breaking point where it could go either way. <laughs> so I, I don't think she'll ever be a competitor by any means, but she enjoys it and she's trying to stay fit. Another question to branch. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so in um, Jerry's presentation, you talked about how squats aren't bad for your knees, mm -hmm. and yours, looking at that guy with the, like, thousand pounds on him, how can that not be hard on your knees? Well, for any of us to put that weight on our back right now, our knees would probably just explode, honestly. But weight. he's <laughs> he's slowly built up to that point, obviously. Mm -hmm. So his quads, hamstrings, everything around the knee are so, is so strong that it's really going to take a lot of that force off of it. And then uh, he also had those knee wraps on, which, which helps his stability a lot and keeps him safe. Uh, and steroids are great for him, I'm sure. <laughs>
And uh, last thing on that, his extreme body weight means there's also a lot of insulation inside of his joint, which is going to help a lot. That's, that's why a lot of those guys get so fat, is for the uh, stabilization that's going to help with the joint. So, Intramuscular fat. Yeah, that's the one. Do you ever see people, I mean, I don't know how, how much you're in the powerlifting community. Do people ever go from being sedentary to powerlifting, or is that not recommended? You need to become a decent health first, right. and then move into that. What's uh, most common? Most common, I would imagine, would be someone going from sedentary to working out occasionally, you know, maybe hitting the cardio machines, machine weights every once in a while, and then kind of, oh, I'll try free weights out. Wow, I like being strong. Let's try powerlifting. That's probably the most popular route. Uh, I, I think it's it's such a niche thing that it would be kind of weird for someone to be on the couch and just say, "Hey, I want to squat 800 pounds." <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. sure it happens, but uh, I would imagine the slower progression is a lot more popular. Okay. And as powerlifting gains in popularity, which it is now, uh, we'll see. I don't know that. My dream is it's in the Olympics someday. Maybe that'll happen. But we'll see. <coughs> that's that's still a couple decades off, I think.